It's not difficult to imagine why it was that the early car manufacturers had some problems getting popular acceptance for their products. They were expensive and that limited the market for a start. But they were also terrifyingly noisy and after all people were used to the relative quietness of a horse and buggy. They raised great clouds of dust everywhere they went and that meant they were also dirty. Eventually it was man's continuing desire to compete that brought the car into popular acceptance. Man had always raced on foot or on horseback and it was logical that he should see the car as a competitive machine. Those early races were very popular and very exciting and they drew very large crowds as a result of which the manufacturers saw them as a shop window for their product. In the long term, motor racing guaranteed the absolute takeover of the roads by the motor car. One only has to take a look at midday Champs Elysees traffic to realise that the French not only invented motor racing, they're still at it. The earliest forms of racing were intercity rallies. And as early as 1895, Paris was the centre of European motorsport, with long distance rallies from here to Rouen or Bordeaux or Marseille, sometimes just one way, but sometimes there and back. The English did not allow motor racing on public roads and no tracks were built yet and what racing there was in America was on a very tiny basis indeed. So this is where it all happened, right here in Paris. And this is the sort of car that made it happen. This is the 1902 Renault which won the Paris to Vienna race. Imagine driving from Paris to Vienna in this. The 1902 race was the best of the Paris races and the last. In 1903 another event was organised from Paris to Madrid and it got underway at 3.45am on Sunday the 24th of May before a crowd of 100,000 people at the start line. Countless thousands lined the routes and at times the drivers were forced to drive down corridors not more than six feet wide lined with people in blinding dust at speeds of up to 80 miles an hour. As a result, by the time the cars got to Bordeaux, 11 were dead and countless hundreds injured. The authorities would not even let the drivers return to Paris. They abandoned the event. The race to death, as it became known, signalled the last of the intercity races. One of those killed in the race to death was Marcel Renault, who had left his shares in the developing Renault business to his mistress. His brother Louis hastily persuaded her to make over her shares to him on the basis that the car industry was about to collapse and by promising her a Paris apartment, an income and free maintenance on a new car for life. He then returned to his workshop and the engineering which made Renault a household name. Most of us when we think of modern motor racing tend to think of the Italians against the English, against the Americans, etc, etc. 
but it gets more difficult when, for example, we have an Austrian driving for Brabham Alpha, an Argentinian driving for Lotus, a South African driving for Ferrari, and so on and so on. But in the early days, nationalism was the essence of motor racing. Indeed, it was the key to the Gordon Bennett races, which commanded popular attention when the Paris races ended. James Gordon Bennett was the proprietor of the New York Herald and in 1900 he decided that the French had monopolised racing for long enough. His races were conceived on the basis that each car had to represent its country in every sense of the word. It had to have been built there, it had to be made of components that came from that country and nothing in the car was to have come from anywhere other than that country. Now that meant for the first few races were a bit of a farce really because the national motoring scene was not strong enough for good representation. But eventually, by 1903, the races were attracting a great deal of attention. And in 1903, Camille Genazzi won on the 60 horsepower Grand Prix Mercedes, the Grand Prix version, in fact, of this rather magnificent motor car. While we're on this motor car, it's worth remembering that at this point it's only 17 years since the car was first designed, built, conceived, if you like. And look what's come of it. It is now one of the very first truly modern motor cars. Incidentally, this is the first of the line of cars known as Mercedes to come from the Daimler factory. And they were so called after the daughter of the French importer who loved the cars almost as much as he loved his daughter. duration and toughness of modern rallies like the like the London to Sydney or the East African Safari have tended to blind us to the fact that those early Paris races and the Gordon Bennett races were really pretty significant events of endurance but even they palled into insignificance compared with an event called the Peking to Paris race of 1907 which was won by this Itala the race covered about 10,000 miles of virtually roadless terrain and it took two months. Even the London-Sydney only took 30 days. These epic events are of such magnitude that they deserve beautiful models like these just to commemorate them. The year after the Peking to Paris event, a real one of these took 169 days to travel the 20,000 miles from New York to Paris via Asia. Ironically enough, the toughest part of the trip was through the ravages of an American winter. It took the Thomas Flyer 42 days just to get to California. The drivers of the other two cars in the event, both German protos, gave up in disgust and put their cars on a train to San Francisco. This eventually led to their disqualification, but obviously enough, they were at least first to Paris. The history of the car is dotted with epic journeys like that of the Itala and the Flyer. But even by their time, most races were being held off public roads on real closed circuits. By 1906, the French, fed up with the tight restrictions of the Gordon Bennett races, introduced the world's first Grand Prix on a 64 mile circuit the venue for the event is a classic name in motor racing, Le Mans. In 1907, the first of a series of great banked motor racing circuits was opened in England. It's 40 years since it's been raced on, and sadly it now lies broken and neglected, but it's still haunted with names like Malcolm Campbell, John Cobb, Parry Thomas, Henry Seagrave, Tim Birkin, and with the sounds of the great engines like Sunbeam, Napier, and Bentley. Its name? Brooklands. And it really was 
very steep on the banking. opened by SF Edge in a 60 horsepower Napier just exactly like this one when he set out on a marvellous 24 hour record attempt and created that record at 65 miles per hour for the 24 hours. Before I got to drive the Napier, I passengered in it around English country roads, and frankly, I was terrified. It's not quite so terrifying to drive, but it remains a monster in every respect. It's a big car, physically big, long wheelbase, and massive in weight and size. Over 12 litres of engine capacity, and a great deal of power, but at very, very low engine revs, meaning that the engine seems to be just ticking over while in fact on the road you're probably doing around 70 to 80 miles per hour or better. And just a few years later, the single most famous racetrack in the world was the venue for the first Indianapolis 500. The circuit earned itself the name of the brickyard because it was constructed of over three million bricks, of which there are just these few left here, uncovered by the asphalt. In a series of races in 1910, the old dirt and sand surface broke up so badly that bricks were used as a replacement. And the series of races was replaced in 1911 by just one 500 miler. The first Indy 500 was won by Ray Haroon driving this Marmon Wasp. Haroon was the only competitor to drive without a riding mechanic. And when all the other competitors complained that he wouldn't be able to see when he was about to be overtaken, he installed a rear vision mirror. The first recorded example of a rear view mirror being used in a racing car. On the morning of May the 30th, 1911, the famous order was given for the drivers to start their engines. Four corners and four straights, the world's deadliest race was on. Everywhere the market for cars was growing. What people had seen on the streets and on the circuits was a whole new lifestyle. And yet only two of the manufacturers seemed to realise exactly what was happening. One of these was Giovanni Agnelli, a former cavalry officer and a director of Fiat, whose vision for the car was not just as a plaything for the wealthy, but as a tool for everyone. The other person to recognise the ever-expanding possibilities of the automobile was Henry Ford. Very early in the piece, he identified motor racing as a good way of promoting his products. And he set out with Harold Wills to build this monstrous car, 
which they affectionately called Old 999. Henry himself drove it on occasions and in fact set a couple of records with it on Lake St. Clair. But eventually he handed the racing over to Barney Oldfield, who in fact was to become a legend in his own lifetime as well. And it's probably smart that he did because Henry had a lot more things to do with the car yet. By 1907, Henry Ford had turned 999 upside down and come up with 666, a much more refined racing car and one which was to be also spectacularly successful until it crashed and was destroyed. And by now, the Ford interest in racing was waning somewhat. Through all of this period, he had been nurturing an ambition and it was time for that ambition to be realised. Henry Ford's dream was really quite extraordinary. In economic terms, the equivalent of any scientific discovery of the age. Ford determined that it was possible to invent a market. Unimpressed by anything that he saw coming out of Europe, and equally unimpressed by the cars that his business partners were forcing him to make, Ford conceived, designed, developed, and introduced the Model T. Ford had already decided that it was possible to apply existing mass production techniques to the automobile industry. But there wasn't much point in doing that if you didn't have a mass market to sell to. So his first objective was to create the mass market. He did that by establishing a giant industrial merry-go-round. He paid his own workers a great deal more money than they were capable of getting from any other source, meaning that a lot more people flocked to the automobile industry and to Henry Ford's factory in particular, meaning that everybody else in the industry had to then put their prices up, meaning that all of those people now on high wages could afford to buy cars and that he had the numbers of people to produce sufficient cars to keep their prices down. It was enormously successful. In its 19-year history, the Model T sold 15 million examples, beginning at $825, and finally selling at a mere $260. A key. That's a bit of a dead giveaway, really, because it was only in the later Model Ts that there was an ignition key required. One of the very few changes made by Henry Ford to the Model T during its 19-year existence. That, in fact, was very nearly his undoing. His stubbornness in resisting all efforts to have him replace the Model T meant that eventually Chevrolet replaced Ford at the top of the American market. Now, just imagine, if you will, that it's 1908 or 1909 or 10, and you, you've decided to buy your first car. It was almost certainly going to be a Model T if you were at the bottom end of the income bracket, so you've invested your hard-earned $825 or so, and you know nothing about cars at all because you've been driving a horse and buggy if not just walking, for all of your life so far. They've given you a manual with the car, and it's going to be a bit confusing for you. Just starting it is a ritualistic procedure in itself. It will say, firstly, retard the spark as far as possible to make sure that when the engine fires, it doesn't give you too much of a kick and break your arm, because retarding the spark has meant that it's going to fire slightly after top dead centre. Give it just a little bit of acceleration, lock the handbrake hard on because that also neutralises the transmission and makes sure that the car won't run over you after you've started it up and you're ready to give it a crank. Even then you have to be prepared to move fairly quickly because it may just creep over the top of you. In this case it didn't, thankfully. That must have been infuriating and it happened quite often. It's just decided to stall just as I get inside it. Fortunately, in this case I can take advantage of Henry's one concession to modernity. This car does have a self-starter, so we'll use that in a moment. In the meantime, let's talk about driving the thing. Uh, it's a three-pedal system, epicyclic transmission, therefore semi-automatic, no gearbox as such. The pedals were all used to either make the vehicle go or make it stop. 
and from the right hand side to the left hand side the first one is a brake much the same as it is today the second one is a reversing pedal we might take a look at that a bit later and the third one is the method by which the gears are actually engaged it's in what virtually amounts to a neutral position right now when you want to move off you take hold of the handbrake which also incidentally neutralizes the transmission and you let it off and at the same time squeeze down and engage low gear get the vehicle moving a little bit of acceleration with the hand throttle which also complicated things a bit and also on the left hand side make sure that your spark is now advanced that is giving you the best possible power stroke and once you've got motion let it off and it engages high gear okay problems yeah that sounds simple enough and it is in fact and especially if you'd never driven anything before but imagine now having to travel a long distance in low gear for example climbing a long steep hill or as a couple of people I spoke to from Kansas in the USA driving a Model T through a couple of hundred miles of mud you've got to drive it all the way with your left foot jammed to the floor to keep low gear engaged not that much fun actually well let's really drive it see what it's all about so much for driving forward but there were occasions of course where you needed to go in reverse that's a whole new ball game in the first place it was necessary to hold your left foot in such a position as to pick up the neutral between low and high at the same time the brake had to be off or it wouldn't roll and then begin to squeeze the centre pedal so that the car would go backwards slight complication left foot's holding neutral and your right foot is making the car go backwards how do you stop it there's no way of getting that foot on there and still going backwards so it meant very quickly on there really it was terribly simple that was one of the strong points of the car that is always provided you'd never driven anything else at all At the same time that Henry Ford was releasing the Model T, William C. Durant was incorporating the General Motors Company, which eventually was to oust Ford from the number one market position around the world and ultimately to become the world's largest company. But at that time, the GM organisation was simply made up of Buick, Olds, Oakland and Cadillac, which at the time was considered to be the American equivalent, at least in terms of engineering expertise, of Rolls-Royce. Around about that time, a Cadillac just like this one won the famed Dewar Trophy standardization test. What happened was they stripped three cars completely and then reassembled them after intermixing all of their components just to prove that they could all run equally well whichever parts were fitted to them. Any comparison with Rolls-Royce must end, however, at engineering expertise because once you start to drive the Cadillac, you immediately realise that they were not in the least similar. The Rolls-Royce by 1907, 1908 was becoming a relatively modern design. The Cadillac was very much old hat.
It's difficult to drive and complicated like early cars of around the 1901, 02, 03 vintage. And it seems that they'd made very little progress between that time and now in American design engineering. An epicyclic gearbox, two speeds, steering which was a bit vague, suspension which provided very little by way of comfort or handling, even at the speeds at which the Cadillac was capable, that is five, six mile an hour perhaps in its low range and around 20 miles per hour in high. It almost certainly would not stop in any sort of emergency whatsoever, despite the fact that it had inboard brakes at the rear. Of course, again, inboard brakes are considered to be a modern design, but Cadillacs had them in 1907, even though they didn't work. By 1913, motor racing had contributed substantially to the development of the automobile. And some manufacturers, particularly in the United States, were beginning to concern themselves more with the comfort of the driver. Cars like this, international buggy, were no longer necessary, that is, high-wheeled cars, because the roads had begun to improve. By 1913, we already had pneumatic tyres, shock absorbers, automatic transmissions, self-starters, electric headlights, and a whole host of other things which today we quite literally take for granted but which particularly were not required on racing cars. And for that reason, production cars and racing cars went their own specific ways. And although there was a great deal of effort over the years to bring them back together at odd times, the twain were never to meet again. The production car had become a fact of life for a great many more people than ever before in the history of the car. Henry Ford had guaranteed a supply of such vehicles and his wages policy had made sure that people could afford to buy them. Motor racing had played its part in creating the desire for the automobiles, but it had now become so specialised that it required special circuits, special cars and even special drivers.